Well, the opposite effect to the motor effect is something called electromagnetic induction. And why we say it's the opposite is because, well, where the motor effect or catapult effect that we've already looked at is when a current passes through a magnetic field and experiences a force, whether it's in a wire or whether it's a charged particle, induction is where motion is made to occur between a conductor and a magnetic field and a current arises. And if a current arises, of course, there must be an induced EMF and in, in an EMF that arises to make the current flow. Well, the best way to understand this is to look at an example. And one specific example that you need to understand qualitatively is that there's an EMF induced when there is relative motion between a permanent magnet and a conductor, especially a coil. So let's take a look at what's going on there. So let's have a permanent magnet, there it is. But also we need a coil just there. You'll see that there's a little meter here. And well, that G it stands for galvanometer. And a galvanometer is basically an ammeter. It's a mechanical ammeter. So it has one of those ammeters with a little needle which registers when current flows. So in other words, we can find out if there's a voltage, an EMF induced in the coil by seeing if a current flows through it. So it's a complete circuit. So if a, an EMF arises in that coil, then a current should flow. So, well, right at the beginning here, we just have the coil stationary and the magnet stationary. Well, of course, those magnetic field lines, uh, would there would be one or two extending through the coil, but it'd be very weak. The field would be very weak out in the region of the coil because it's quite a long way away. And so, well, there would be no reading on the ammeter at the moment. What I could do is say, well, OK, let's just kind of bring this whole coil a bit nearer. So I'm going to bring it right real up close to the coil just there and leave it there. Well, would there be a reading? Well, the answer is no, because when it, while it's stationary, there's no relative motion between the bar magnets and the coil. It's only when there is some relative motion that you actually get a reading on the ammeter. So if we go back to the beginning, well, we would get some motion only during the process of bringing this magnet up close. And you can see sort of as we move it nearer, ah, well, magnetic flux is now cutting through the coil. You're getting more and more flux going through the coil. In other words, as that motion occurs, we get more and more flux linkage. There's a change in flux linkage passing through the coil. And, it's, and Farad, Michael Faraday mainly and others experimented on this in the 1850s. And they basically assessed the factors that make a difference in terms of what kind of induced EMF occurs. And you can probably guess quite a few of them. Um, Obviously, if I move that, coil, that magnet towards the coil really fast, then I'm getting a, there's a faster rate of change in that magnetic flux linking the coil. The direction matters. If I move it away, then I'm reducing the amount of flux. So that might have an effect. And you can probably guess that it would make the galvanometer needle go the other way. And so there's all those kind of uh, things to take into account. But the key point just at this stage is that it's that relative motion that causes that uh, induced EMF and therefore an induced current. OK, great. So let's just summarise those, um, those factors. Well, first, first of all, um, we've got the idea that the strength of the magnet, the stronger the magnet, then clearly if we've got a nice strong magnet there, then we're going to get a, a bigger, the, the, the same relative motion will call, cause a bigger induced EMF. And the number of coils in the galvanometer are. Do you remember that the flux linkage is n phi? So um, the area times the magnetic flux density times the number of coils. So the number of coils matters. And um, the speed of the motion, we've already discussed that, but also the direction of the motion as well. So there's a whole bunch of factors there which would cause an induced EMF. Um, we sometimes refer to this um, as flux cutting. So that process where a magnetic field lines 
cut across a conductor or vice versa, I mean, I could be moving the coil instead of the magnet and it would be the same. Well, flux cutting is that relative motion, basically, and, and that's sometimes a good uh, little phrase to use. So another way of producing an induced EMF is just observing a coil and then changing the current in another coil, a primary coil, that means, linked with it. OK, so let's see what's going on there, because that's not quite obvious. Well, what we're saying here is that we've got a primary coil, a kind of initial coil, which is doing the current change. So there's going to be some kind of change in current in that coil. And then we've got the coil that we're interested in. This is where we're looking for the induced EMF. And of course, as usual, we'll know that by if something registers on the galvanometer. So, well, <clears throat> let's suppose, I mean, in this circuit, we can see that the switch is on. So there is a current flowing at the moment. And so that means that there will be a field kind of stretching out through space and linking through the other coil, the coil that we're interested in. So, there, so now, of course, it's a static field. So there won't be any reading on the galvanometer at that moment. I'm going to get a graph going here so that we can sort of understand um, a bit more clearly what we're saying. So in other words, from the beginning of time, we've got just a constant current flowing through the coil, horizontal line there. And then let's suppose at this first blue line, we open the switch. And so, well, if we open the switch there, then what we're going to do is do that. Well, of course, what's going to happen to the current is it's going to rapidly collapse down to, down to zero. It's going to go sort of something like zoom like this, and then it's just going to be zero along the bottom. And the question is, what will be the effect on the secondary coil, on the coil with the galvanometer? Well, let's look at it by drawing another graph which shows the amount of magnetic flux passing through the coil. Even better, let's look at the specifically the magnetic flux linkage. So we could call that N B a. Well, N is the number of coils that we've got there. B is the magnetic field passing through because of the primary coil, the first coil. And A is, of course, the cross-sectional area of the coil there. So, well, what will that value be equal to? Well, it's going to look something very, very similar to the current. I mean, of course, the scale will be different. But it's initially, until the switch is opened, it's going, to be, it's going to be a constant value. It's going to be just going, going to be across here. Why? Because we've got a static field. So the amount of flux linkage, NBA, is going to be constant. I could call that, of course, N phi, couldn't I? N phi. It's the same thing, flux linkage. And, but of course, when the switch opens, that is going to do exactly the same as the current. It's going to rapidly collapse down and hit the bottom, hit zero. Well, what that means is that during that collapse, so during this moment of the current collapsing, the field collapses, and therefore the flux linkage collapses. And so the, the lines are kind of gradually disappearing uh, as, the, as the field collapses. So they're cutting across. There's a, there's a change in flux across the secondary coil the coil with the galvanometer. So there will be an induced EMF because it's when you have this relative motion of the field lines with, the, with a conductor that that happens. So interestingly, if we now have a graph of the magnitude of induced EMF, well, that would have been zero initially. So, that's, so while the current was static, that's, there's nothing going on. But of course, just during the collapse and only during the collapse, we're going to kind of get this little little peak of EMF. There's going to be a little burst of activity in the galvanometer because there's flux change, because there's flux cutting. There's a, there's a, a collapsing magnetic field and it's the, the, the flux linkage across the coil is changing. And then, of course, that's it. Then the current is constant. It goes zero now and so that all goes back to normal. 
let's imagine now that we close the switch at this second time. So if I put here, at, say at this point, let's supposing we close the switch. Well, the opposite is going to happen. We're going to have a sudden rapid increase in current. It's kind of going to go zoop up to the big value again and constant. So, and, hope, and you might be able to guess what will happen with the flux linkage. Well, the flux linkage is going to do exactly the same because the field is going to grow and come back to its original value. And so we're going to get another burst of, magnet, of induced EMF because there's now the field goes from zero and grows and cuts through the secondary foot. So there we can draw another burst. Now, it will actually be in the opposite direction, which we'll talk about later, but I'm just doing the magnitude of the EMF at this point. So I'm just going to do another peak um, looking like this, just for that, that region of change. Okay, so let's suppose we then just allow that status quo to continue for a little while. So up until the next kind of moment. And then now at the next, uh, at the next time indicated here, at this moment there, let's suppose we do something a bit different. Let's suppose we start to mess around with the variable resistor. So let's suppose we gradually increase the resistance from this, uh, from this point here. So increasing the resistance in the, in the circuit using the variable resistor up until say that point. So let's imagine that we increase our variable resistor resistance and so the current's going to drop down and we'll do it sort of a steady rate so that we just get a sort of steady decline and then we just leave it at some value at the end. Well the field is going to follow suit as before because it's bare proportional you know that's the size of the current is proportional to the size of the field so that's going to stop that drop down at a steady rate not that my line is very straight there. Well, what's going to happen this time to the induced EMF? What's the galvanometer going to do? Well, there's going to be an induced EMF, but it's not going to be as big. And the reason is, is because remember the last example, when we moved the bar magnet towards the coil, the permanent magnet, it was how fast we did it which made a difference because it's how fast the field lines cut through the conductor. It's how fast the flux linkage changes actually. So if we're doing this slowly, if we're, so we're starting with a big field in there and then we're just gradually reducing the field, then that kind of change is taking place much slower. So as a result, the induced EMF this time is just a more, is a more mellow change. It will actually be a um, steady change because we're changing the rate at which we alter the magnetic field steadily. So that's kind of what's going to happen. Interesting surprising and well in the next section we're going to have a look at exactly how that's quantified well these ideas are encapsulated in a really important couple of laws faraday's law michael faraday expressed this from doing a lot of experiments that the induced emf is proportional to the rate of change of flux linkage in other words the faster the the flux linkage in a coil, for example, changes and the bigger the induced EMF is going to be. But there's got to be a, ch a change occurring in order to get an induced EMF. And he wrote that as an equation. Well, let's start off, let's just write it, induced EMF is proportional to the change in flux linkage over the, time, the change in time. Well, uh, so hopefully that makes sense. That's pretty clear. Uh, rate that delta n phi, n phi is flux linkage, and delta t is time. Well, Faraday wrote it, and the form that it appears in the, in the um, data booklet is with, a, with equals, and the constant of proportionality is neatly arranged to be one. So it's just d n phi by, delta, by dt. Good, so they're basically the same, those two, except this is an infinitely small uh, change. So it's exactly the gradient of the flux linkage against time, the flux linkage graph against time. <clears throat> well, we'll see how to use that in some detail um, later on in some examples. But there's something else to say, because there's another law, which um, Lenz's law, which someone called Lenz came up with, 
which says that um, something else is going on, that the induced EMF is such as to oppose the flux change creating it. Now, what does that mean? Well, Faraday's law really is telling us about the magnitude of the induced EMF. What Lenz's law tells us is the direction of the EMF. And, and he realised that the, the direction of the EMF is always going to try and stop the change that's occurring. Now, that's a bit of a weird idea, but we will investigate why that must be true um, in the next section. But we just need to know for now what the effect of that is on Faraday's law. And the effect is, is to add a minus sign in there. <laughs> so um, a relatively straightforward change. And you can sort of see a pose, so, so it kind of makes the, uh, the EMF kind of the opposite direction. But we'll explain that in much more detail later. For now, all you need to realise is that this uh, is what's responsible, Lenz's law is responsible for that minus. And now, those two laws, very important to learn those two sentences. You know, that the induced EMF is proportional to the rate of change of flux linkage, one mark, uh, or two marks usually, and Lenz's law, the induced EMF is such as to oppose the flux change creating it. They're often examined, and people write, and I know as an examiner, people write down all sorts of things. So it's really important to get those accurate. And, it, you know, and so if you sort of have a vague idea, it's really easy not to get those marks at all. So um, in the next sessions, we're going to have a look at a few classic situations for those and see and really kind of dig, dig down into what's going on in those equations.